two, three, four, five. And I see that we're like a minute, one minute um, after our starting time. But in, in terms of the board, I see myself, uh, Ash, Danette, Alyssa, Vernon, and Steve. Joe, if my <clears throat> math is correct, that's five and not enough for a quorum of 14 uh, members. Is that your view of it? Well, we need seven members since we have 13 current members. So okay. Who's Steve? Uh, is it? Are we at 15 now? I thought we have 13. Okay, okay, 13 <clears throat> official members. Uh, we can start the meeting, uh, and it would be a meeting without any uh, voting uh, if we don't have enough uh, members with us. So we have six, we need one more. Allison said she'd join in later today. About That's right. I got minutes. that note. And, and Debbie uh, Hartridge said she'd be gone. Yeah, uh, Laura Montagna is also out too. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that. So who are the remaining um, uh, people? Allison going to come later. Uh, my mind, I don't. No Madison Flynn, no Colleen Broderick, no Oscar McGowan, no Gardner Carlson. Yeah, Gardner let me know he couldn't uh, um, make it. Well, Allison said she'd join us in i don't know about 50 minutes after our start time so i'm going to get us started and when we get to other business in which we need to vote on then hopefully she will be there with us um welcome everybody our monthly behavioral health board meeting with the advisory board uh for the board of supervisors and we hold this meeting on the fourth thursday of each month and it runs from 12 15 to 2 15. this is a public meeting and everyone is invited to attend. We provide time for public comments, and I will say more about that a little bit later. Please note that this meeting is being recorded, uh, a regular uh, requirement or desire to do that. But if this is uh, too uncomfortable for you, members of the public, um, uh, to uh, say something that you might feel it was you don't want recorded, then let us know that and we can perhaps stop recording at that time or give you another time uh, that where we're not being recorded and you can share your comment with this. So we start, um, oh, I want to remind everybody uh, who's not speaking at the time to mute. Um, so if your dog is barking in the background, we don't need to, to hear that. Also mute your phones. Uh, you can put them on uh, buzzer um, and respond to them as you need to. Uh, so we start every meeting with a roll call of the board members and then an introduction of staff and then members of the public. We invite you to share your name um, with us. You're not obligated to do so. We also allow time for those speaking to inform us of their um, preferred uh, pronouns. So why don't you get us started, Joe, with a roll call of board members. Alyssa Norman. Here, she, her. Laura Montagna, excused. Steve Madrone. Present. Okay. Tim Ash. Here, he, him. Tim Doty. I hear he, him. Madison Flynn. Allison Tans is running late. Debbie Hartridge, excuse. Colleen Broderick. Danette Kellerman. Here, just me. Vernon Price. Here, he, him. Gardner Carlson, excuse. Oscar McGowan. Okay, again, so we have six out of 13. We need one more minute so we can vote. Okay. 
for any official action. So I invite then the staff members present to please introduce yourself to us and tell us what your position is with the Behavioral Health Department. Hi, I'm Paul Bagnacki. I'm Deputy Director of Behavioral Health. He, him. Hi, I'm Jeremy Nelson, also Deputy Director of Children's Behavioral Health. He and him. Jack Brazil, the Deputy Director for Behavioral Health with our Adult System of Care. Jessica Duke, uh, she, her, and I'm Senior Program Manager over in Adult Behavioral Health over CCT and Health Center. Hi everyone, Sonia Lovey Boyd, she, her, and I supervise the Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaboration and the Peer Coaches at the Pay Division. Laurel? Good afternoon, Laurel Johnson. I'm an analyst in DHHS administration, she and her. Well, thank you. You might want to turn your volume up. Uh, we had trouble hearing you. We did hear you though. Other members of the uh, staff of the Behavioral Health Department. Good. Hi, I'm Christine Messenger. I'm with the DHHS Communications Group. Great. Hey, I'm Rhonda with the Hope Center. Um, her, she. I'm Betty with the Hope Center as well, and I'm she, her as well. Great. Glad to have you with us. All right, then. Um, we may have other staff with us at this time. We don't, <clears throat> excuse me, have Emmy Boxler Rogers. She's out with some uh, sick time. And Connie uh, seems to be not here with us. Laurel, do you know whether she's able to join us or not? She is going to be able to join us, but it'll be a little bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. So members of the public who are here with us, um, we invite you to share with us who you are, and you don't have to, um, but we invite you to, to speak and tell us who you are. Okay, hearing uh, uh, no one else, um, then we don't have members of the public. The people are here, are our staff or, or board members, the best that I can understand. Am I correct on that? Does anyone else uh, from the public would like to introduce themselves? All right, and then um, adjustments to the agenda. We do this to if case there's a time challenge um, for people who are here, here, are there any adjustments to the agenda so we can uh, look at them later? Okay, I don't see any. So let me just say this about the public uh, comment. The Brown Act is a requirement to have open meetings to the public and invite public members to come and comment on the areas uh, about which a board um, has jurisdiction. Uh, we invite you to talk to us about anything on your mind for three minutes in the beginning um, time and, and leave it to three minutes and also no harsh or uh, adversarial language, more respectful language is re requested. Um, having again seen no members of the public, um, we'll move on to action items and on my agenda number five, that would be to a the approval of minutes from the January 26th meeting. Everybody a chance to read them? And... Uh, Tim, and... we don't have a quorum to approve them. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for reminding me of that. So it, it may hang around for a while. So we do have an opportunity, we've talked about it before, to have a presentation from the Hope Center. Many of us uh, know a little about you or haven't heard from you in a while. So why don't you introduce us and give us a presentation on who you are and what you do and anything else about that you would like to share with us. Alrighty, um, I'll go ahead and bring up our PowerPoint. I can do that too, Rhonda, if you want me to. Um, if you're able to do that, that would take a little bit off okay. of navigating yeah. stuff. Okay. Great. Thank you. And if you would like to press, yep, there you go. Thank you. 
All right. So we're the Hope Center, and actually today we wanted to start with an announcement. Um, due to the poor weather, we will be open today and tomorrow until 4.30 so that there's a little more um, space for people to be waiting for those emergency shelters to open. Most of them, um, the overnight ones, are open until 5.00. So there's somewhere for people to go. Um, and then we also have hot coffee and tea, and we've got a heater and shelter and food. And so um, if you know anyone who's in need of that, please refer them to us. Betty, would you like to take this slide? For now. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Currently, we've been working on more one-on-one -on -one support. That is Tuesdays, and that's allowing us to do our Zoom classes and our one-on-ones, which is where we support people in going out and doing endeavors. Um, we've reestablished our advisory board. <laughs> yeah. Reestablished our advisory board starting last month, working on having volunteers back at the center. We have a couple of volunteers looking at volunteering currently. And um, we look, for, look forward to bringing them on. We're bringing back May's Mental Health Barbecue. That's gonna be really fun. It's gonna be at the community, That's Jefferson Community life. Center. Oh, my bad. That's We're jumping right. ahead. Develop long lasting relationships with community entities and create more rounded educational aspects to the center. This is some of the new staff we have um, going on here. It's very exciting. Um, Jack so wonderfully held on with us while we didn't have a senior program manager. And we are absolutely delighted to have Jessica come in and help us out in that position. She's been um, pretty amazing and she's supported us well. And she aligns well with the peer movement, which is always really nice to have someone do that. We've got Betty, who is coming in as our peer three, um, and she's fit in really well with the center as well. Participants and staff members just love her. She gets along with everyone well and works really hard at um, doing the best that we can do. Uh, we also have our two interns, that's Serena and Mary. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get a picture of Mary, so um, there's that, and they have been um, working with us, they've facilitated quite a few classes and they were able to um, get us a grant for a quilting class so we could buy supplies and whatnot. Um, this is our CalFresh. Uh, we use our CalFresh for a lot of different things. Um, so there's first Healthy Harvest and um, we have continued that. That's something that we haven't let go of. We were doing it during COVID as well. And this month we were able to support 84 individuals with food security. Um, we've also had some participants request that we provide some staple um, foods like eggs and um, flour. And we're looking into seeing if that's something we can do with our CalFresh budget. Um, there are snacks that we provide for incentive for attending classes, but also to help people with food insecurity get through the day. It's hard to learn new things when your biggest concern is food. Um, we have the garden, our cow fresh, uh, pays for any seeds or supplies we need to keep our garden, which is great. It allows individuals to choose the kind of food that they want and learn how to grow it so they can support themselves. Um, our, we're gonna do a cooking class we're planning on doing it once a month um, where we can help people learn to cook without supplies that the average person would have like a stove. So how do you cook rice in the microwave and um, fun things like that. And then of course our barbecues and picnics is funded um, food by through um, CalFresh.
May is Mental Health Month. I am just starting the planning of this. We are very excited to say we will be having our barbecue back this year. We'll be holding it at Jefferson Community Center. It's going to be wonderful. Um, and then um, we're going to, we, we did the walk last year. We will bring it back again this year along with the pro, proclamation. proclamation. That'll be on the 2nd of May. Yep. And then we'll have our big rally as well at the courthouse that month, day as well. The signs we're going to do in April because the second comes so quickly in the month. So we'll be doing our signs in April. And we will let you guys know as things progress. So the peer support certification, um, the Hope Center peer coaches are working on being trained. A lot of us have had previous training. Um, but we're trying to refresh ourselves so we can take that certification in it and be confident about passing it. The certification was passed um, as it was recognized um, in 2020, 2020 um, through Medi-Cal so that some of our services can be reimbursed. Uh, the beauty of the peer support being able to bill medical is that we do have a different view and we're not as when we build we don't have to be as strict stringent on those goals so you might have like a housing goal but somebody might need support in another area and we don't have to necessarily connect that all together if that makes sense <laughs> um so uh yeah and the Hope Center will offer participants Medi-Cal. Excuse service. me for interrupting, but we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and other comments. So hopefully we'll do that. And I want to let you know we have that time. So I'll give it back to you. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, Hope Center will offer participants Medi-Cal um, services. And this is an optional thing here at the Hope Center. We don't want to feel, we don't want anyone to feel pressured into it, but we are, um, explaining to people how this could be really beneficial for them. There are a lot of things that as peer coaches and being in the environment and center that we're in here, we see something different than other people do. And being able to record that down can really be beneficial for people. <laughs> what we will do, we have a lot of things coming up currently providing recovery oriented programming and services. That's just a part of what we do, develop a lounge area, you know, just somewhere where somebody can come in and just be comfortable for five minutes and find their way around would be wonderful. Um, we're extending our hours starting this coming month. We're gonna be open until three versus two o'clock. So that'll be really nice. I can't breathe at this again. Improve and reimburse emergency supplies. And that's just so that we can, you know, have our center prepared in case of an emergency, honestly, and that we have people here that need our support while that emergency is occurring. Collaborate with the community programs and resources. So just really get out there, hit the ground running and get more people involved in our program and involve ourselves in their programs a little bit more. Develop more sustainable community garden. Our goal would be to have like some raised beds. Um, there's a couple things that we really wish we could have that would make it easier access to some folks that really want to participate. Bring back storytelling classes and work towards digital stories. So um, in previous history, we've been able to let people share their stories and record it for their own documentation, for other reasons, for their own personal use. And just so that people can learn to tell their story and, and have it heard is like really important to them. Mm -hmm. So we hope to bring that back as well. And I think the last one there is individual staff development, which is, of course is something we're always working on. Um, you can always learn more 
And so uh, that's something that we're going to work towards. These are some of our hopes and dreams. This is what um, our end goal is. This is what we'd love if everything was available in the world. And um, so provide additional staff support. And we're working towards that with volunteering. We also have um, those interns coming in. It is also additional staff support. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to get wax workers back here. Um, so that's how we're going towards it now. Um, additional mechanisms for providing food choices. So that would be ideally like a stove um, and things like that. So that um, we're available. We do a lot of activities that involve cooking and it would be ideal to have that ability and I would like to see someday in the future if everything could be exactly the way we want it to be to be able to provide lunches to people every day um, so a full kitchen would be great <laughs> we'd like to create a more welcoming and inclusive uh, space and some of that has to do with being able to manage the space. Um, and we're hoping to open up the middle room soon. There have been some challenges as to why it's still closed, but hopefully when that opens, some of these challenges will. Um, yeah. But um, sometimes we're so crowded that someone walks in and it's overwhelming. So they walk out and we really want to be able to create a space where everyone feels comfortable in our space. Mm -hmm. Shower services or vouchers is definitely something we'd love. Um, there are some people who feel very uncomfortable coming in when they smell, and that shouldn't be a challenge for people. It's a lot easier to focus when you feel clean. Um, and I think that it would, benefit us a lot. And then of course, laundry services, same kind of reason. And also this can be something I know in my personal experience, I can go to a dark place if I'm not able to see these very minimal um, personal care things. And so this would also be something that could help us prevent people from falling into a bad place. We'd be able to kind of pick them up before they um, went too far under. And then we would like uh, an ADA accessible space. Our tables are not ADA accessible, which is a major concern for us. And I think that it's just important that there's ease of access to our center. And then 15 years. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to give you a little feel about the history of the Hope Center, and then we'll open it up for any questions or comments. Um, so in the beginning, it all started with a pilot plan that the DHHS had started, and the program was called the Recovery Center. It was ran by a man named Jim, Jim Selly. Unfortunately, at that time, there was no MHSA funding for recovery centers and the funds ran out and that kind of inspired the um peers in the community to to do something about it and um from then they started a pilot pro or not a pilot program they uh started a working group mhsa was working on approving or voting on specific funds for a peer ran center. And so this working group started getting together what they liked, what they wanted in the future. And eventually MHSA did vote for those funds for a peer ran center. Um, and that was around 2005 is when that working group started. In 2007, the Hope Center was ready to get up off the ground and get a building. They'd actually originally planned to partner with RCRC but unfortunately, they were unable to find a place to put the center. 
And that is when DHH came in and they said, hey, we've got a space and we'd love you to be around. And um, so in 2008, the Hope Center officially opened umbrella with DHHS. And now we're celebrating 15 years of being open and supporting people. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, help me, let me uh, kind of facilitate the questions and answers, but most of them will be going uh, to you. So I see two hands up and I see Vernon's up first. Vernon, jump in. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Mrs. Oath, I'd like to ask a question um, on what is the percentage of participants uh, right now post COVID um, that deal with unhoused citizens, being unhoused citizens of our community that would benefit from the showers and the 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 lunches and stuff of that nature. Can you give us a percentage or or, or some raw data there? Off the top of my head, um, if I'm going to give it to you, I would say that probably a third of our participants um, have either experienced homeless, well, not even that, have either just recently been housed or are currently homeless. Um, and shower services are, and laundry services are a big concern for those community members. And I think it would be extraordinarily beneficial for uh, your overall well being to be able to have a place to take care of those needs. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, I see two more hands up. Uh, Tim Ash. I'm unmuting. Um, yeah, that, thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, I was um, happy to hear you talking about the showers and laundry. I think that, that those are the sort of things I think when you have a peer run facility, um, people think of maybe more um, than just the average person on the street. Not everybody has access to those things and it may, makes us all feel better. So I'm really glad that you guys are on that. Um, the question that I have, um, well, two of them actually, is um, for your peer your peer certification, the training, um, will that be available to uh, people that are not currently employed? So just anybody, um, and I just say that because it would make sense to get some people trained if they're interested in the community so that in a future time they um, could more easily be employed and brought on board. That is an amazing question. And um, yeah, anyone can, well, anyone with experience can um, apply for this Medi-Cal Peer Support certification, certification. certificate. Um, I'm not sure that the grant to pay for things is gonna be around for much longer, but it is a real big thing right now. So there are a lot of trainings through WISE University that are doing trainings for free. Um, I think that also the Copeland Center is doing a couple. And uh, so, you know, if you just look into it, you can go to Cal Mesa Peer Certification and it kind of jots down all the different programs and places that you can go for this. But anyone can do the, um, the certification and we're willing to help people through those steps as well mm -hmm. yeah and, and it wasn't that, that i was thinking about getting the training it was just more it, it makes sense to have some outreach in the community more proactive on on the part of the county to see if there's anybody out there that has an interest then the the last question i have is one of the last slides that you did i can't remember what the title was but you mentioned something about um, easy access to the wellness center, and I didn't, I didn't get that. I wonder if you could explain that. Yeah, so that was in our hopes and dreams slide, and um, so we really want to push for the future um, ease of access to the center. So we have some struggles with, um, like our tables. They were donated in the beginning in you know 2007. That was donated to the mm -hmm. center. And they're not accessible for people in wheelchairs. You can't get under them. And although that might seem like a small issue, it's 
just connecting people. If everyone's sitting and looking at each other and there's one person that physically can't do it, it's just connecting. It's, um, it's separating the community. And then also we do have some challenges with our front door. It is not as accessible our back door is. But because we have um, some challenges with the HIPAA, we have some private offices back here that need to stay private. We can't have that door unlocked, which is also very challenging for someone with any physical disabilities because they'd have to have a phone. They'd have to know that they need to call the front door for us to come unlock it for them. And it's just inconvenient and not as welcoming as we'd like it to be. Well, the, those things all sound like related to the Hope Center, but the slide said wellness center. Yeah, that's, we, we are a wellness and recovery center. That, oh. That's like the overarching category for wellness centers across the state. Mm -hmm. well, what's the title of the building that's down on 7th Street? The, the public health building, 7th and J or whatever. That's the community wellness center. And that's okay. the, yeah. That's so, the confusion. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And I believe that is public health. Well, I know I know who who's in there. I just was thinking that um it it's kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. Because that's when you said wellness center, that's what I thought of. And I was trying to figure out what the connection was. But thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Tim Ash. I see a hand of Alyssa and then Sonia. Alyssa. Hi, hey everybody at the Hope Center. Hello. Um, fantastic. Yeah, uh, Tim, you asked about the peer specialist training. I'm actually signed up for the peer specialist training, and I talked with Betty from the Hope Center when we were discussing it, what I could learn from that training. So I'm going to bring peer specialists uh, to our own organization, which is fantastic. And then, um, I just wanted to say you guys are fantastic. I, I love seeing you and I love everything that you're doing. And that would be great if you could get a, a bigger building with all the amenities and the full kitchen and everything. You guys are fantastic. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Um, Sonia. <clears throat> yeah, echoing similar. It's always fun to hear what the Hope Center is up to as it's a very parallel uh, space to the Tay Division, the Tay Center. Um, and just want to put a plug in that Tay loves to partner for Mental Health Matters Month and um, host a sign making as well and be part of that. So please reach out to us when you start setting up the community meetings so that we can um, make sure that we're in alignment with hosting some activities as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yeah. Thank you, uh, Sonia. I, it was at back of my mind the qu question of the interaction between the Tay Center and the Hope Center. Do you do a lot of that, or? Um, we have in the past done a lot of um, collabing together. I think that with COVID and everything, we have separated a lot from the community entities that we used to have, which is part of the reason why that's a goal this year to get those connections back and really strengthen it. And especially with Tay, because there's that middle ground where people are just transitioning out and they qualify for our program. And so um, helping people in that transition where they don't have to kind of fall through those gaps is a major goal of ours. What's your thoughts, Sonia? Yeah, I would say, um, I think just the peer coaching, teaming together between the Hope Center and, and Tay, you know, a similar, um, job classification, and then um, or always encouraging the peers when um, youth are aging out of Tay to set up warm handoffs to the Hope Center to show our young people that there's other community resources that they can get connected to before they fully age out of Tay. But definitely lots, lots more that can be done and, and hope for the future that we can continue building like yeah. opportunities. Yeah, thank you. I, I, and just listening to us, I think there's great opportunities, and I'm imagining people at Hope Center might have stories that could be shared uh, with participants and Tay, and and vice versa, shared resources or whatever. You guys know what I'm talking, know 
best, but I encourage that. Tim Ash, I see your hand up. Yeah, this is not a, not a question, but a comment. Um, just out in the future, it's just, I'm hoping that if and when there's another TAE facility, a TAE facility, another Hope Center uh, location, that it's more centrally located. Um, I know that that was the attempted to do that. It isn't, but with the mobility problems a lot of folks have, having it out at that campus is, is just really inconvenient. And the other thing, as I hear this discussion, it would be really nice. I mean, this is gets a little pie in the sky, but to have it co-located or nearby to a TAFE facility so that there's an easy movement back and forth or at the handoff point that Sonia mentioned. But uh, the location and the facility both could be improved. So your, your comments on, on those from the Hope Center. Um, I totally agree with you. Um, and I think that right now in this transition out of COVID is a really great time to do it. This is like um, a refresh for us. Before COVID, we had started to become very overwhelmed with what we are able to provide, the space that we have, and how many people needed our services. And right now we're at a manageable state, but it's going to get back there. We're, it's gonna increase, it's gonna happen. And this is our time and space and opportunity to really prepare to handle that better this go around. Yeah, and I, I was thinking that the Navigation Center has been working on it for a long time and has some development areas in it and i don't know if that to be close to that uh would be helpful or not i don't know but um so sonia your hand up again yeah just um a lot of parallel desires uh for hopes and dreams between tay and the hope center you know we try to do a lot of work to bring showers to tay and um, laundry facilities and all the things that they mentioned are, are similar struggles of the tay division uh, faces and so much of it is funding, but also infrastructure and ADA requirements, uh, leases with landlords, things that prevent us from really meeting the requests and needs of our community. Um, so we, we struggle with that as well. So I'd love, and the garden, garden and all those things. So uh, hopefully between one of our two sites, we can move forward with finding ways to get those uh, needs met for our, for our community. Yeah, so let me uh, just share another comment. I've heard for a long time that a major um, addition uh, to the work of the Hope Center is simply to get a new building, a bigger building, all the access, the kitchen, the lounge space, uh, all of those things. And we all kind of think that's almost impossible um, uh, to get. Uh, but I think we shouldn't stop. I, I, I think there's a lot of support to do that, although the task is very challenging, uh, but looking at that as a multi-year plan uh, that would work with Tay, the Na navigation center, but also highlighting highlighting the critical importance of of what the Hope Center does. That that it is a very important part of our behavioral health work in the county. Other questions or comments. So Jessica, why don't you introduce yourself to us a little bit? Congratulations, glad to have you on board. Thank Tell you. Tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Jessica Duke. Um, see, I started at County December of 2010. I spent about like five or six years in the children's division and then uh, as a clinician and then went to be a um, supervising clinician in adults over CCT. And I've uh, been working with the Hope Center, um, collaborating on, uh, with clients uh, since uh, April of last year. Um, before that, I was a case manager and a clinician in Los Angeles County, and I worked at Portals, um, which had a wellness recovery center um, called the Mariposa Clubhouse. So I'm really familiar with um, peer um, specialist services. And I did training and motivational interviewing for some of the peers who were employment specialists because they had an employment um, program for clients. So um, that's a little bit of my history. 
And um, I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. And um, any other questions? <laughs> well, that's great. I know others may want to share something, but I've seen the clubhouse model as a really powerful, important thing. I visited uh, the one down in the Bay Area and got a tour and saw all those things going on and it was amazing, but also see how challenging uh, it was to do and eventually getting county funding mm -hmm. uh, to help make that work. I, I think, and Tim Ash, you can correct me, is that that clubhouse model was in the thinking from the uh, the beginning, uh, kind of post-treatment, recovery, support, and a peer-run clubhouse kind of a thing. And so I would I would see that important to continue to expand and move in that direction. So Tim Ash, what's your comment on that? Yeah, I um, the term was definitely used during the MHSA process. Um, whether or not um, the actual concept that people had here involved the things that you're talking about in the Bay Area or the one that Jessica mentioned in LA, I don't know. Um, it, it, it makes sense to try to figure out what's the most successful model and see if you can duplicate it. But I, I'm not really sure what people thought it would be looking like. I mean, I could list off some things that they are doing, but if there are some things that they aren't doing at the Hope Center that are being done elsewhere, then I don't know if those things were mentioned. My understanding, Jessica, and you would know this much better than me, but participants in the, the clubhouse that need to be connected to clinical uh, treatments uh, to be a part of it. Am I wrong on that? I, I think there were a lot of people who were uh, and there are members, but that you could always be a community member and show up and ask questions and participate. Um, I don't quite, it was quite a long time ago, but um, they had a lot of services like employment support and they had connections to different employers in the community. They had recreation, they had classes, they had a peer run, um, they called the friendship line. Um, where peers were trained to um, provide support on like a kind of like a warm line. So they had a lot of different activities going on and they um, got a lot of their training and support from the village in Long Beach. Yeah, the one I went to, they actually had a peer run uh, lunch box kind of a thing mm -hmm. where people could come in and the peers were making sandwiches and they were in charge of it. They also had a recording studio and they oh. published their own magazine. I'm sure this is according to their desires and the skills they're mm -hmm. part of. But that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm so um, I'm impressed with it. I guess the other thing is uh, your, your peer uh, experience uh, and the whole power of the peer movement is uh, kind of a shared experience. And uh, how do you see that from you as a as a supervisor? I, I think that um, with a lot of uh, folks who haven't had that experience, they can't they don't they might understand intellectually like what someone has gone through or what they learned in school. But having that peer lived experience um, really provides a personal sort of um, point of view where they can they're like this person really gets me they've been through it yeah and that that can really change someone's life it's not just you talking at them or being the professional it's like you've been in the trenches um struggling or trying to or succeeding against some really challenging situations and symptoms or life situations and that can make all the difference to someone who's who's tr you know who either first time going through it or um, continuing to have those challenges and i think that makes all the difference in the world thank, thank you that's thank you very much i see two more hands up uh jack why don't you jump in here i just wanted to um uh, spell out the acronym that Jessica used a minute ago, CCT, which is Comprehensive Community Treatment. And the reason why I bring that up uh, mostly, though, is, you know, I know the Behavioral Health Board is looking for presentations on our programs, and that would be a good one to think about uh, as a lot of intersect with uh, populations of Hope Center and CCT and 
um, we'll also be doing some analysis of our CCT program versus AOT program that we'll definitely share with the board, um, but would love for you guys to hear about that program as well at some point. Thank you, Jack. Uh, very helpful. And thank you for uh, pointing out acronyms. Uh, I always keep beating the drum on. Vernon, I saw your hand up and down. I do, Joe, want to recognize that two board members have joined us a little late, but that's fine. We have not been able to do official business uh, until you got here, Allison and, and Madison. So welcome. I'm glad to have you with us. Um, so let's move on. Vernon, your hand is back up. Is your is your battery still holding on? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Oh, it's your time to speak. I would like to, I don't know really what I may put myself in a conflict of interest here. So uh, not only am I just a board member of the Behavioral Health Board here in Humboldt County, I'm also a participant with lived experience of the Hope Center. So what I'm saying by that is we, there is, a future past one's mental health addiction and or, or mental health diagnosis and addiction. So we can, if we want to move forward, improving the quality of life, building a stronger community and a more vibrant county that we all live in. And I think, and I'm so proud of the Hope Center. Thank you, Vernon. Thank you. Alyssa, your hand up. That is wonderful that Vernon said that. Um, I would like to wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I have a peer group here at Tri-County Independent Living and I'm um, on the Behavioral Health Board and recently just got um, um, uh, on the Human Rights Commission. And it's just wonderful that, you know, um, we can experience mental health and, 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 um, find stability in our lives and be able to move forward but it takes a lot of inclusion on the side of the community to be able to do that because there's a lot of stigma around individuals experiencing mental health disabilities and in it, it, it that's not a journey that everyone wants to go on or be supportive of you know they oftentimes push individuals with disabilities out of their organizations like whether it's conscious or not, they're just not aware of the type of energy and support that it can take to be there for people who are disenfranchised to the community and haven't gotten the support that they need to be able to integrate in a meaningful way. So if you all really want to be a part of the peer movement and, and make it a lot easier for us to find a way and a home and a job and in a life that's worth living just know that it, it's a journey and we appreciate it more than anything and we may not be able to tell you first off you know uh, as soon as we get there it might take a couple of years to be able to work through the challenges that we've experienced to be able to get to a point where we're articulate about the what we've experienced but in the end you will have saved a life and it's worth it thank you Alyssa other comments or questions? <clears throat> well, thank you, um, everyone. Uh, uh, just to, I, I see your hand, Sonia, but um, I, I've wanted to know, we have peer family, a parent, you know, we have peer coaches in other areas. And to have a better understanding of the whole peer movement that the behavioral health department is involved with, it, it may be, an, other areas in terms of like public health i don't know and so because of the peer movement i think it would be good at least for me to understand the breadth of it uh at some time i don't know who would make that presentation but um so that's enough for me sonia another hand yeah i just wanted to maybe get my own clarification that um peer coaches within dhhs can sit on the behavioral health board um so i guess just asking if there's any outreach or encouragement to get any of our peer coaches on the board. I think we've been working on that, Tim Ash, that you can be employed as a, a peer person well, and still be on boards. Yeah, that, that bill's <clears throat> passed about three years ago. And I think with regularity, we bring it up just to make sure people understand that because some people don't. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it's, we're very, I'd say we're pretty vocal about it. We have been with Tay, I know that. All right, thanks, Sonia. I see another hand, Jessica. Uh, do you think that um, maybe we can have, put up a flyer or have some sort of thing uh, to post for peers saying that um, they can apply to be a part of the board so that they know it's available and maybe uh, get help doing that? Jessica, you have tremendous uh, power and, and authority to do this. And so we would back you uh, every way we could. So uh, it's so great to see members of our board being volunteers and, and working with you. And uh, we want to support you. So yes, we can do that. We're not exactly sure how. We might need to give you a personal check written by Tim Ash. Um, but, you know, I don't know how we're going to get there. Tim, ask your hand is up. Well, that would be a forgery of one of your checks. But um, anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> what I was going to suggest is that um, it might be a nice um, a little piece in the uh, in the DHHS newsletter, because mo I think most people take a look at it and anybody that's up here look at it and go, oh, OK, I didn't know I could do that. So. That might be probably the most focused way to get it to the people that would need to see it. Thank you. Good idea. Other comments or questions? Wow. Uh, this was great. Uh, as I said in the, in the beginning, we've uh, changes have happened and many people haven't known a lot about, you know, what you do, and, and you've been very helpful and thorough. I'll see another hand up there from Alyssa. Alyssa used to be the last hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I am actually pretty good at making posters and uh, familiar with the Behavioral Health Board. Um, it, if you want to work together or uh, just assign it to me, we can do that too. And um, it would be great to be able to get another individual uh, living with peerness on the board. Great. And I just also want to say uh, Nomi has some money for small projects like that. And uh, Tim Ash, uh, Debbie, and I are on the NAMI board. Well, I want to wrap this up and not promise anybody else's money uh, to support you. Thank you. It's good to meet you, Jessica. And I've forgotten the names of the two peer preachers. I had trouble hearing them because of your mask. Say them again. Um, it's Serena and Mary are our interns. All Serena right. and Mary. And we have okay. to thank Terry Bodden for that. She's uh, <laughs> amazing at what she does. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you extend our support and thank you for this uh, presentation. All right, we're gonna move on with the agenda because we have a quorum now. I wanna circle back to action number five and that is to approve our minutes. Um, I always assume you've read it. Um, uh, so, uh, what do you want to do? You want to approve this? Give me a motion. I motion that we approve the minutes. Is I there a second. second? Okay. I... <laughs> okay, Danette, I see you're 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 in the corner, the shady corner of your place. I did, I saw your hand. No, thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. All in. <laughs> all in favor of approving the minutes? You can raise your hand or say yes. Whatever works best for you. Thank yes. You. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It it looks almost uh, unanimous or unanimous. So now we have the time in the agenda for communications, and this is for board members to bring um, their ideas, thoughts, uh, opinions, information related to or questions related to our work. So it's an open time for our board members. Um, are there some things, Vernon? I see your hand up. You have communications. We we talked about that. Fire away. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Vernon Price. I'm a board member of the Behavioral Health Board uh, here in Humboldt County. I, I will be asking for a member, another member of the board to be on an ad hoc committee for the Hope Center. I will be submitting a Humboldt County Behavioral Health Board ad hoc proposal at the next uh, executive committee. 
If I can get one more board member, that would be greatly appreciated uh, to be a part of this ad hoc committee. Um, we do have a, a participant. Another participant is that would be uh, a part of this. We have two staff people uh, from the Hope Center that is willing to be a part of this. So at this point, I would like to ask the Behavioral Health Board uh, if another member would like to be a part of this. Great. Basically, you know, as an ad hoc uh, committee, you need to have kind of a focus. Uh, you said Hope Center, but maybe something more specific. But Oh, I yes. Think... Uh, it will be more specific uh, in the, the written proposal. Um, I, I'm just throwing it out there uh, unprofessionally right now. Uh, I was more professionally to present this in person this afternoon, um, but was unable to. Uh, so it will be professionally done. Uh, with a written proposal with all the specifics where, you know, it can be considered at that time. Got it. Uh, thank you very much. We can put some time on the agenda for you to to do more specifically about that ad hoc um, committee. Thank you, Vernon. Remind us, you're going to be able to be at the executive board meeting to... Uh, on the not? first. Yeah. Yes, it, it is on the first, correct? That's correct. And and Joe, we're going to be meeting in person. Is that right? Yeah, starting in March, it's in person. Yeah. Okay. And it's at the admin office at 824 Harris. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Alyssa, you took your hand down? Yeah, I was interested in more information. And But uh, if Vernon's going to do a write-up and present that at the next meeting, then I'll wait. Okay. Tim Ash. Yeah. Um... I have a couple things here, um, and uh, Paul, you might want to take notes. Maybe Laurel as well on this. They're kind of questions for the for um, the branch and DHHS. Um, the first one was on posting. Um, I was wondering if someone could get back to us and tell us where our um, agendas are currently posted, um, and where I'm kind of going with that is just. There was an issue during um, during COVID, but um, um, some of that I think is not an issue now. But but um, I personally would like to see our agendas posted back at the courthouse, uh, where all the other agendas are. I think it makes it just more accessible. That's where people expect to see agendas. Um, but anyway, I'd like to know where they are now, so we can talk about that at a future time. Um, I was also wondering. Um, I, if we could maybe get our invite, you know, Joe, you send the invite out a couple of weeks before this meeting, but I was wondering if we could get kind of a, not so much a reminder invite, but um, a, uh, an additional one the day, early the day of the meeting or the day before, because I, I know, I'm sure other people have the same issues. They, well, I know we're having a meeting today at 1215, but where the heck is that Zoom connection you know it's, instead of having to go back and put a search on it for joe's name and, and look through maybe multiple um emails so i just wonder if we could maybe get that um and um let's see. also um i have a question about it sounded like we were talking about um uh, in person only and i just curious is there any idea of doing hybrid meetings? And I would suggest that that would be a good idea for access in the community, particularly some of the folks, the, our clients and other members of the community might have mobility issues or may have issues with anxiety and social settings. Uh, I just think it would be um, a nice thing to add to, to get more input. Um, and, um, so the other question, part of the question is, um, if we have a meeting, hybrid meeting, and one of the uh, venues, either the electronic venue or the in-person, is down, what should we do? This came up about a month ago where uh, we had a hybrid meeting and decided that it wasn't going to be at the, uh, the in-person thing wasn't going to be set up and I think that was probably counter to the Brown Act but um, 
first off, we got to figure out are we going to do hybrid meetings? And second, what do we do if we have connectivity problems? And then the last thing, um, Danette, Danette sent a letter to Behavioral Health uh, several months ago about a client. And we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, and I think we need to talk in the future about how we handle letters to us. But that letter had some some things in it, it raised, raised questions and um, some a few things that were kind of concerning um, about, you know, things that had happened in terms of services provided. And I'm just wondering if, if since we were copied on that letter, if when there's a response to that letter, we can get a copy of it. If there's going to be a response, I don't know what the plan is, but I, I think there should be a response. Okay, those are our, our comments. Are you looking for a specific answer right now, Tim? Well, on the, the letter Danette sent, yes. The other ones, um, I think we can, if we can get the answers at our next meeting, that, that's fine. Okay. I do want to share with that. Uh, there's a new bill that was passed uh, uh, from the state about official meetings. Uh, but I'll get to that in a, in a second. Vernon. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I, and I do apologize. I would at this point like to make a respectful request for consideration. Uh, since we do tours um, from time to time every year, I'd like to make a suggestion of or to tour the Hope Center as a board uh, to where we can uh, speak with the participants along with the staff and with administration um, with, you know, questions of where does the funding streams start and begin for the Hope Center. Uh, one specifically estimated at $338,586 uh, and anticipated for the MHSA. Was just wondering where that goes to the Hope Center. Uh, with being toured the facility uh, by the grand jury this year, it would be wonderful to be toured also by the Behavioral Health Board with its recommendations and findings. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Vernon. We've done some of those um, in the past, and I have questions about uh, the whole board showing up for something that becomes a, a public meeting or something like that, how we would do that best. But I don't have any answers for that. Tim Ash. Yeah, I think if we were doing that, we'd have to notice it, but it's a good idea, I think. Um, the um, I just wanted to kind of throw this out. It's related. I appreciate what Vernon said in terms of a um, of a tour, but I just want to, uh, for the future meetings where we may be talking about some issues related to our our role or at an offsite if we do one, Um I would suggest that everybody take a look at the material that Joe sent out when you got on the board. And there's a welfare institutions code section that lists all the responsibilities of our board. And uh, I won't go into them, but I can tell you that one of them is that we're supposed to be inspecting facilities. So, uh, so Vernon, that's a great suggestion. What I would suggest is that Somehow, if we're doing that to minimize disruption, as Tim mentioned, um, would be to kind of work those things together that so out of that inspection would come the kind of report that we're supposed to be doing. Thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, uh, another question I have with such things as maintaining uh, confidentiality and privacy for the people who are there. We can do it, we've done it before, but that's part of the uh, uh, consideration of how we would do that. Alyssa. The Hope Center has a community uh, meeting every month. Um, it's on the 22nd of March. Um, it, that might be a good time, you know, because if there's a lot of uh, interference already occurring, we might be able to arrange for a tour maybe during their community meeting or after it. 
Thank you. Maybe this uh, executive committee, we can proceed to find the best way to do it. But I, I like that, Alyssa, we can uh, work on that. Um, I guess I would like to tam take this time in communications. Oh, Tim, you had something else to say? Yeah, I was just going to say that if um, if it became an issue in terms of, I mean, I appreciate everything everybody said, but if it's an issue in terms of confidentiality, one way to deal with that would be to make sure that it was not a Brown Act meeting, that it was part of an ad hoc to um, to do our part of the reporting that we're supposed to be doing. That, you know, kind of doesn't address the fact that if there are more people want to go, uh, that would make it a Brown Act meeting because of a, uh, a majority. You'd have to figure out another way to do that, which might be, uh, you know, another at another time for those that couldn't go for the ad hoc. Thank you, Tim. And and Jessica, you would have the most knowledge about how to, for HIPAA rules, confidentiality and things for your input on such a tour would be very helpful to us when we get around um, to that. I said, uh, Rhonda and Betty, you can comment on this, but I think maybe announcing when the tour is going to be and if anyone would like to participate um, in the tour would be really empowering for the participants and people who feel shy or are not interested in being there. Um, they give the opportunity to avoid that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes. This would be one part of, of the reason of asking for the ad hoc committee. That that will also be in writing uh, with that intention. Thank you. Then you can perhaps your committee can take a lead on organizing this and to make sure that it uh, works best for all the things we've uh, been talking about. Um, I want to take this time. Then I was going to do this for the chair's report, but it seems uh, germane right now. I think Joe sent out to everyone. Uh, like a two-page document from Tracy uh, Domico, is that her, how you pronounce her name? She's the deputy clerk of the Board of Supervisors. And what it is, it, let me just read the opening chapter. Uh, currently, any Board of Supervisors created committee, commission, or board must comply with the same set of Brown Act requirements to which the Board of Supervisors is bound. The county is currently operating meeting under AB 361, which allows for remote participation from voting members of committees, commissions, and boards. The governor's declaration of emergency, which has allowed for meetings under AB 2449, is set to expire on February 28. So remote participation will then be governed by AB 2449. Four nine. I think I said the wrong one under AB 361, which is the emergency one. So AB 2449 spells out the future of, of going back to the way we were and then uh, adding or keeping on uh, the new things we've learned uh, from COVID about uh, Zoom meetings and hybrid uh, meetings. So every committee and, and every board will need to comply by these things. This was mailed out to everyone, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought, Joe. It's kind of a thing you might uh, zip by uh, pretty quickly, but I think it's important for us. And maybe on the next board meeting, we should just have an open discussion about what this uh, new, um, the new rules we have to go into. Um, so, but basically, we're supposed to meet in person, um, and then there are exceptions uh, that can be allowed. Emergency, you don't have to be in person. You can uh, participate from a remote uh, setting. It says you can't vote uh, if you're doing that um, for whatever reasons requiring us to be sitting in the same room uh, to actually do our, our voting. Um, so some level of a hybrid could work at the, at the professional building because we have the all and the capacity to do that for groups. The executive committee or other committees that don't meet in that building uh, presently do not have that digital apparatus uh, to take um, care of it. So it may be we need to bring in a laptop and do a Zoom. Uh, if, for instance, the executive committee is over at the admin building, uh, and that's the way to 
to facilitate people who are not able to be there to participate in the executive committee uh, and other committees. So um, this is confusing. Um, I kind of understand it. We're basically going back to the way we did things uh, and the law required us to do in the, in the past, trying to squeeze in uh, somewhere in between that. And so I don't, I think we should have more discussion on this. All of this is starting next month because February 28th is when the old rules, the emergency rules um, are no longer um, in place. Just so that you also have areas of, you can not be there on the uh, by the via zoom or whatever uh, for a just cause or an emergency situation and i don't want to go into the definition of those two things but so it is a little more complicated um so i guess i would like also someone uh, in our next uh, board meeting do the presentation on it from either legal counsel or someone to if we have questions uh, about how this goes executive committee um, can address the best way to go ahead on this. But I just want to let everybody know the rules have changed and we're to abide by them. Uh, any other quick comments or questions about that? It is confusing. We need to give more attention to it. Tim Ash? Yeah. Um, I, I was reading up on some of that stuff last night and it sounded to me like this whole experience of COVID that people... Um, appreciated some of the benefits of remote participation. It sounded like, well, we have bills right now and that's what we obviously have to, you know, have our activities directed by, but, but that there's some talk about um, trying to figure out what's the, you know, what's the best way to do this out in the future. Um, so is the next, I, I might've missed it. Is the next meeting going to be hybrid? Yes. Uh, Joe, we've got that room reserved for the yeah, fourth. The March meeting will be set up with hybrid. Yeah. Okay. So, going forward to all that. so the the other thing I just want to kind of throw out there for the future, because I think it's always good to at bare minimum allow the public to um, view what we're doing if they can't make it in person. But um, one possibility, if we really got into a bind if we didn't have the right equipment would be to do it just by phone conference. Um, I don't, in, unless there's some ADA issues with that, that I'm not familiar with, that might be one way to do it. If you were stuck and we're doing it at the mental health admin building and didn't have equipment. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know much about These are it. things to work out. Uh, what are the requirements that, the limitations, how can we adjust them for our own purposes? Those are things that needed to be discussed. Alyssa, I see your hand. Um, what are we doing about the executive meetings? We're going to meet at the admin building, as we have done in the past. And Oh, yeah. We, oh, yeah. There's a little tiny conference room. Is uh, that the place behind Wood Street? No. So Jay. Next to the water, across from the water tower on Harrison Day. Okay. It's across from SV at a oh. caddy corner. Okay, it is that one. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you. All right. Uh, we need to read it again, everybody, and I want to have a presentation or I would say an open discussion with someone who has a better understanding of the legal requirements and how we can uh, modify them there so if you're prepared to go on um any other communications i don't hear any so we have uh reports uh coming up from uh, dhhs behavioral health director aot uh, any committees and chairman and the vice um, chair so let's go with uh, uh connie i see you, you've joined us there you are connie You're muted, Connie. Yep, I'm muted, that's for sure. Um, first, I just want to say, Hope Center staff, I, I, I don't know what your name is, but I just want to say thank you for opening the Hope Center for the cold weather. I just saw that notice in the email. So just want to say shout out to you. Yay. Thank you for doing that. That's awesome. Um, mm, let's see. I guess the only thing that I want to mention is 
on March 14th, we're going to the board um, to uh, do a presentation on the Navigation Center for Eureka and um, bringing forward uh, maybe a draft lease and an MOU um, to get started with that project. And um, then in the couple weeks after that, we will start the community meetings. I'm not sure of the date for the community meeting yet, but it will be out of um, the Eureka City Council um, meeting space. And so we'll have more information as it comes, but it's pretty exciting that we're finally in this place. So, so the, but the first one will be at the Board of Soups on March 14th, correct? On the March 14th, yep. Okay, uh, Jack is leaving us and so is Paul. Um, so let me just say this to um, to everyone, and that is I had a conversation with Emmy about the Board of Supervisors' interaction with the Behavioral Health Board. And one of the things we came up with is the, has to have a greater urgency of going to the Board of Soups and listening to um, the presentation by the DHHS and we can speak at that time and we can listen more specifically uh, what's going on. We can increase our role as a behavioral health board in what the department is, is doing with the Board of Soups. So that's just a, a comment I have on that. And not everybody wants to do that. I'm, I'm not a big fan of going to the Board of Soups, uh, but it is a way for us to uh, more actively participate. Um, Emmy is not here, um, so I don't know if any uh, our yeah. other... Best. Jack is still here, Tim. Jack is here. I thought, Jack, you were trying to escape. Jack, you have anything from Emmy? Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy and Paul had to, to oh, leave, okay. abandon me. Um, I, you know, I do have maybe some a couple of AOT things I can do when we get there. But other than that, I'm not sure too, too much more. I uh, really appreciate the Hope Center's presentation today. Um, we had a meeting on the crisis residential last week. Um, and that's still all moving forward really, really well. Um, we're still sort of targeting that that early fall for for being opening, but they're uh, working on uh, plans still mostly. You know, they've got an architect uh, that came last week, late last week, and uh, but once they get those plans finished, they expect to they have a contractor already, and so it, it should be good. So that crisis residentials. Uh, looking well to get going. So I would say that for for, for our bit today. Th thank you, Jack. I didn't know that you were acting um, supervisor <clears throat> for the Hope Center in that interim. Oh, yeah, yeah. When uh, the uh, <laughs> Hope Center's come a long way, you know, COVID really put the brakes on things as it did everywhere, really, you know, and, and uh, all of our peers just... Uh, very amazing. They really stuck with it and did a lot to help where we could. And so glad to see it. Betty thank on board and Jessica. So, Yeah, thank you, Jack. Vernon, I see your hand up. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this question is uh, for Deputy Director Brazil. Um, I, I do greatly appreciate that. There, there was a request made by myself and Rhonda Oath that uh, we meet with you. And uh, Mrs. Duke, uh, now that she's back, I, I'm just nice to see you back, Mrs. Duke. Um, if we can meet uh, someone at, at your earliest convenience in regards to funding streams and uh, other other uh, potential funding streams, if that would be okay with you, Deputy Director. Yeah, sorry, Vernon. I, I know that I uh, saw that email and communicated that I want Jessica there. I'll make sure that my secretary is uh, working on that meeting slot with you. Uh, we'll get that done quickly. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Um, so I think I've said what I want to say um, as a chair. Also, uh, I'm letting everybody know that I need to go on a writing uh, retreat and also call it a Lenten retreat. I'm going to do that at home and greatly minimizing my participation uh, in many of the activities uh, that I do. And that would include the Behavioral Health Board. So I'm open for participating uh, in some things. Um, that's pretty much from, uh, from me. 
Um, so <clears throat> we often put in update on AOT and Navigation Center and Care Court, and we've begun talking about that. So maybe Jack, a, a, a little bit more about AOT program and how that's going. Sure. Um, well, we we have gotten to that place. We have uh, you know ten slots that that are funded for AOT, and we have gotten to that spot where we've sent ten referrals, and there are ten participants in some former fashion with EA Family Services, um, and um, and and so we're there. We're at capacity, um, and we are working on a presentation for the Board of Supervisors that's going to have some outcome measurements associated with that, and happy to bring that to the Behavioral Health Board when we get that finished and done for my next, you know, update to you all. Um, the other thing is we're going to court uh, today um, at our first participant that we have decided that we need to utilize that intervention in terms of asking a judge for court ordered services. And um, so that that will be kind of our, our first participant uh, doing that. Um, so I'm anxious to see how that goes. Um, but that, uh, yeah, that's our updates. So Jack, I'm assuming that those are confidentiality, the name of the person you're talking about, the program in gentle. Am I wrong on that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tim. One more time. Are they confidential or are they like uh, any court uh, hearing that yeah, people can participate? It's, it's on the confidential calendar uh, okay. that, that uh, these cases go. Um, thank you, Tim Ash. I see your hand. Yeah, Jack, we talked about this a little bit. I just want to get a couple things clarified. Um, I, I just, my kind of eyebrows went up and you said that you've got one, you've, you've had 10, am I right? You've had 10 referrals total. We have sent 10 referrals on to EA family services. We've had more referrals come to us to, to vet, you know, with, within the, um, that first step of the process. Okay. Cause determine if they're eligible. Oh, you guys determine who's eligible, right? Yeah. We have an internal uh, group of us that looks at referrals that we get from wherever they come from the community or, or even internal to our, ourself and decide if, if individuals meet sort of that threshold or criteria. And then we send them on to EA from there. Okay, because my, my understanding is that um, when you talk about capacity, that you would be talking about 10 people that were actually fully engaged. Um, in other words, they referred to EA, and EA did their determination as to whether they could get the person voluntary service. If the people would engage in voluntary services or not, and if they wouldn't, then that's that and you wouldn't be using that pot of money to provide services for them. And, and what I'm going to ask is, um, it's, you said you're going to be doing some measurements of uh, outcomes. If you could explain somehow, um, you know, with some type of uh, numeric data, um, of the 10 people that are um, over at EA, that they've, you know, they're kind of moving into the, uh, the realm of what is funded by what the board provided, especially for AOT. How that breaks down, I understand that one of them is going to be in the court process, but there's nine that aren't. And what services they're receiving and what's paying for them? Because I think when we talked, you said that they could be Medi-Cal reimbursed for at least some if not all of the services provided. So I'm just trying to figure out what the drawdown is on what the board provided versus what can be funded with money from uh, federal and state um, dollars. Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think that we can do that for sure. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, EA, EA is providing services and then billing Medi-Cal for those services. And that's how 
AOT works, right? And then Medi-Cal reimburses a portion of what uh, of that service, right? So then the other portion of that would come from the um, the the general fund that we get um, from um, from the county. So you know that's g generally there's you know Medi-Cal reimburses at like at a fifty percent rate for things, right? So um, that would be that figure that that we could get. Uh, the referrals that EA are getting um, are going to be individuals who are known to have refused county behavioral health services in the past, right? And so they, um, the EA is either doing outreach and engagement with them or they are providing voluntary services. And if EA has gotten to the point where they're providing voluntary services, a lot of times um that's a that's a good spot for those people right because we sort of know that at least they're engaging and they're doing well um at some level there would be a transition back to county behavioral health services and we would you know talk about when that point is for that individual again if they're agreeing to voluntarily get services and so um that I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but, you know, we, we are aware that at some level we need to move people and transition them. But for the most part, these are folks that we're really interested in them being stable. And if EA is providing that stability to them, then, you know, they're probably in a good spot. Yeah. And, and that does answer my question pretty well. And I agree with you um, that if, if they're not, if they're otherwise refusing voluntary services and they're accepting that's great it's just that um you know supervisor madrone i'm sure would uh would uh, agree that those discretionary general fund monies are you know they're out there for the grabbing and there's often great needs for them so i'm just concerned that that um that we're set up with a system that um you know that we're not spending the general fund money on reimbursable items or if we are uh, well no yeah so. no the the only way that for, for the services that ea provides those are all going to be medical so we're always going to build medical first for whatever it is that they do except for the education and training um, which would be like EA billing for their time when they went to NAMI, right, um, to present on that. So, well, what would happen if if the um, if the board came to you and said, "Hey, we're we're taking back half of um, what was allocated. We, we will not get it in out years or further out." Um, where does that kind of leave you? Well, I think that's what we're hoping to kind of ascertain, right? You know, I had mentioned this. Uh, comparison with AOT and CCT, right? You know, and, and the effectiveness of these programs and the, the benefits that we get from it, right? And to see how we can further justify that, you know, expenditure with AOT. So I guess that's all kind of just part of the analysis. But um, are these people that have refused CCT? Mo well, most of them, I would say at some level, right? But they've refuse services or just have failed to follow up at all after multiple site hospitalizations. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> Jack, if you have a time where you're going to go before the Board of Soups? I think we did uh, settle on a date. It was March 21st or two. <laughs> what is it, Laurel? March 28th? Yes. Yeah, March 28th. <laughs> I think we had it for the 21st. <laughs> but... Oh, yeah. you're going to have to use sign language now. <laughs> that would help. So that's March 28th. Okay. Board of Soups. Um, I, I just want to uh, uh, go back to the whole issue of face-to-face um, -face, uh, uh, meetings. It seems to me there are two aspects of it. One is accessing 
allowing people to access and participate from a distance and makes it easier from them for a lot of or or all of the things that we tackle in health and human services but i i do feel like this is going to be a it 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 is going to help i do feel like if we have people that are able to be available and engage folks it it is going to help so i'm i'm looking forward to it and me too tim ash i see your hand up yeah i wanted to follow up and ask jack um did you say what's the date of the um the time you'll go to the board talking about comparing CCT and AOT? Because I'm March 28th. Okay, that's the 28th. So what yeah. I'm wondering, is there any way for us to get a copy of your analysis in a way that we could, in a timing that we could potentially discuss it at our next meeting and then make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors? Um, I imagine so. Our next... Uh, Board meeting is um, on the 23rd again. Is that right? Yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind. I mean, I'd have to review it with Emmy. And, you know, if you guys want that presentation, that's certainly yes. okay with me. Well, not, not necessarily to get the, the presentation, but at least to get the, the written data and uh, rationale because... Um, I mean, that's part of our role as, as a um, advisory board of the Board of Supervisors is to take a look at programs and facilities and make recommendations as to, you know, keeping things, not, not keeping things, uh, changing. Okay. Yeah, yeah the I'll, more I'll talk it over with Emmy, but that's fine. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's kind of a big deal because if you remember, um, DHHS was not in favor of AOT when it first came around, but they made a good effort to get it up and running, but we don't know what the recommendation is going to be. So it's possibly the community stakeholder group may want to make a different recommendation. All right. Thank you. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of this uh, meeting. I'm assuming there's nothing more to um, say about the care court because it's still out in trial among what three or four different counties and we're all kind of watching for some report on that to see how they're doing it. That's kind of where we are. Does that your understanding, Connie? Um, yes, and um, I and we were we were initially going to um, start a work group now. Um, to to talk about a really well, actually, just plan around services for care court, um, and we were doing that through SIM, uh, the sequential intercept mapping meeting, and um, we decided that we should hold off of it because there are those state the 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 pilots that are happening in other counties. Um, that would make more decision for us. Um, they're they're going to do a lot of the work, so we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so we're going to wait, hold off a little bit. I think six. Did we think six months, Laurel? Mm, we were kind of toying around with it, weren't we? But but we do want to have a we do want to have a, a a county work group that really focuses on the work around care court so that we have all the departments that will be impacted um, to be part of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, Tim Ash, I see your hand up. Yeah, You're Connie. Old? Go ahead. Connie, I was gonna ask you, um, I missed a, a working group meeting in Sacramento last week um, due to a brain malfunction and uh, but there are some groups that, are, that have been meeting statewide. I don't know. I'm just, my question is, do you have anybody that's assigned to kind of follow what is happening in other places? Because, um, you know, the timing of when we would get formal reports may not be um, work well with the statutory requirement if it comes along to us. Um, it just, you know, I, 
I just think it would make sense to have somebody that's watching it and then they could advise you on, you know, well, we should start working on this or just too soon to tell that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, Nancy Stark, um, Sharon Wolf, Jack, um, there's several of us, Emmy, as part of um, CBHDA. Um, everyone has their eye on this, Tim. Um, there isn't one of us that are, are um, you know, we haven't said this is your thing and you need to pay attention to it. Uh, but w we um, we have a lot of not only concerns, but also just, you know, how do we do this along with all other things that we're doing? Um, so planning around this, um, yeah, for services, uh, for, for, and, and for clients that we continue to serve, um, th this is going to be a little different. Um, and, and we have more partners involved. So really important that we're on top of it. Okay. I guess that's a long, that's a, a long answer, isn't it? No, it wasn't too long. Um, it, it, it's complicated <laughs> though, because there's, there, there is more to it than just behavioral health. Right. Um, so you mentioned sequential intercept model. Um, it just occurred to me the other day that, um, since Virginia, Virginia Bass left the board, we don't have a board uh, invitee uh, sitting on the sequential intercept model. I don't know what uh, Supervisor Madrone's schedule is. I'm sure he's got time on his hands. But anyway, uh, hopefully we can get someone who's willing to uh, sit on that group. Yeah, and that that's not an official um, board. Um... I'll, I'll I'll talk a little more with Alicia, the CAO, around that because that's not a, a that's not a an official committee. Um, but I do know that Virginia was very um involved, and I think mostly because she was part of Behavioral Health Board, um, at the time. So it makes sense that that. Supervisor Madrone would be invited also, um, but it's not a required meeting for them. Right, I know. I just, just it's great, uh, it, great information, though, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Is it? It's it's really looking at it from a systems view instead of mm -hmm. just the you know the crisis of the day. More planning. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you. We're well, Steve, your hand is up. I recognize you. Yeah. So, uh, Connie, can you send me more information about that particular committee and when does it meet? I will. What you mean is Laurel will do it. That's what you really mean. <laughs> It's it's irregular though when we meet. We just started meeting again after a, a long time of waiting for what Care Act was going to look like, um, and so we are starting to meet again. Um, the the sequ the sequential intercept mapping, just so that everyone knows what that is. Um, that meeting stemmed from a step up conference that a bunch of us went to um, several years ago, and we came back and started making plans on how we could um, better serve the population um, that were involved with courts, law enforcement, and behavioral health. Um, Virginia actually went to that meeting with that conference with us. Um, Tim, did you go too? It seems like you went also. No, I was the one that brought it up to Bill Damiano that it was happening. And when mm -hmm. it came down to it, there wasn't enough spots. So the official people went, and, which is fine. But um, yeah, the whole, the whole thing is, as you mentioned, is kind of a, 
the goal is to map out communities, uh, the systems, and then try to figure out when people contact the criminal justice system, how can we divert, these are people with mental health issues, how we can divert them away from the criminal justice system. That was kind of the goal, but. Yeah, and, and um, it actually was great because we, we did that mapping, we identified some areas, we actually have mental health diversion and a couple other things because of the work that we did um, around that. So um, super interesting. And um, the more that we can do to, uh, well, we know that um, a lot of our clients spend more time in jail than others. Um, so we need to, we need to work on that. So yes, um, Supervisor Madrone, I'll send you that information. Thank you. We could all learn more about that. It sounds like it, it's in the early, uh, almost conceptual stage, um, but it sounds like a, a great thing. So we're at the end, and so we're like at future um, items, trying to plan ahead and and. I want to bring up something that an executive board we've shared, and maybe in that general board. But our last executive committee meeting, Laura Montagna uh, wanted to have a discussion time. She's uh, the chair of the membership committee and involved in interviews, recruitment, and, and those kinds of things. Um, to have a discussion time, or, or what does it mean? what kind of people how do we decide well how do we prioritize the people we're going to uh recruit and i think we touched on this at the last um board meeting but we all left uh, well what does it mean to be a consumer having lived experience what does it mean uh, demographic uh, uh things like that um so thanks uh allison and so I would just I'll take it to the executive committee is to set a time to discuss that. Um, and there are, there are other things uh, that are just kind of process things. How do we do these things, procedures? Uh, and it's not an agenda item. It's not a presentation. It's a discussion time. And I would put that. Uh, oh, the other thing, we should spend just time discussing the whole new change uh, in our meeting uh, where we are. We talked about that, having a good lengthy discussion about that. Um, so there may be other things like that, but we've talked, I know Tim Ash and I and others of giving ourselves more time to talk about things and not responding to a presentation or feeling like we need to vote on it. And so, those are two things I think we can put in and maybe give like 30 minutes to those two things and uh, let the discussion uh, go a little bit more freely uh, on that. So those are my thoughts. You can uh, get back to me or send it to the executive um, committee for idea of, of having a discussion time. Steve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, very quickly chime in on the new laws regarding hybrid meetings, voting, yes. and the rest of it. My understanding, I've gone through quite a few trainings on this, as you can imagine, with all my committees. Um, my understanding is that it takes effect uh, in March. This is the last meeting that we are allowed to do strictly uh, in Zoom. So starting in March, we have to have uh, in-person meetings and um, we can only vote if we're there in the room or if we use one of our two exceptions for just cause or emergencies. Um, and those are laid out in some detail and perhaps it would be good to send that out to all the board members because the way it's supposed to work is that if you're unable to attend in person, you can call in and you can vote as long as it's only one of two meetings that you do that at during the year. Uh, and when you are remote, you have to, at the start of the meeting, state what your reason is for just cause or an emergency, and that there is nobody in the room under 18 with you, and a few things like that. So well, I just wanted to be clear, I believe that we have to start this process 
Yes, Steve, we did discuss. Uh, unfortunately, that, that's going to, you know, we need to kick it into gear and get it going. Yes, we un I understand that. Uh, the item that came from the deputy clerk was sent to us and Joe sent it out to everyone. Uh, and, and so more clarification. I really appreciate that and be very valuable if you can be a part of um, that discussion. So Joe, I did say, why don't we send that document um, out again about AB 2449 in case people have accidentally deleted it or something like that. So they can have that and look at it again. Okay, Joe? All right. Okay, Steve, anything else? No, that was that. Good meeting, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Tim, ask your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Steve, that that was really clear. I went through that stuff for 40 minutes last night, looking at some Brown Act stuff for another reason, and that was a really good synopsis, I think. But there's a couple questions that kind of are outstanding there that'd be nice to have figured out by our next meeting. Um, one thing I will say is I think the requirement is that you have to say who's there over 18. And if there's anybody under 18, you don't have to say anything about it, you know, to identify that they're there. Um, but um, the question for, that I have then is if we're doing hybrid meetings, can the public participate via electronic means? Uh, I guess that's it. I guess that's the main question is can they do that? And uh, can they, well, first, can they watch? And second, can they also? make comments and I, i've never heard the answer to that one maybe i just missed it in all the verbiage the answer is yes they can participate remotely and um view it and participate and comment the only real restriction is on the voting members okay cool thank you thank you very much we have a couple more minutes left um and so are there any other comments um for the good of all before we wrap things up i want to thank you all for coming here i know it's not easy and other people had other commitments and and had to leave and i understand that and, and support that but again thank you thank you very uh much and so we're going to adjourn the meeting thank you again we'll see you in a month in person Thank okay, you. Tim, enjoy your uh, celebrating Ash Wednesday and Ash Month. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Talk to you later. Thank you.